But I know in this uh, series, in this topic that Pastor Bob's been speaking, I was curious to hear anything notable that anyone could remember. I know it's a lot can happen in a week before last, uh, after a Sunday. Uh, but I was curious if anything kind of stuck out to you if you've been in the class for the last couple of weeks. Obviously, it doesn't mean there weren't notable things, but just curious if anyone had anything they wanted to share. Last week, oh yeah, Evelyn. Well, last week he talked about selective obedience, mm -hmm. and that uh, kind of hit me right in the heart because I think that's what I do, oh, yeah, <laughs> and right. I wish I didn't. Yeah. You mean like uh, subconsciously making a decision? Yeah. I, well, he said, you know, you're either obedient or you're not obedient. Oh, yeah. But yeah. some people are selective; they yeah. do it a little bit, but not wholeheartedly, yeah. and every time. Yeah. And I'm working on that. Yeah, I think we all are. We like the buffet Christianity. Yeah. Like, I'll put this on my plate, yeah. not that. Yeah, that type of thing. I know Cliff asked last week, I, I watched a little bit of it, uh, what did Paul mean by that he might obtain the resurrection? And Pastor Bob had said that Abby would speak, would uh, answer that question. But I'm going to put it back on Pastor Bob next week. He can answer that question. <laughs> but actually, Pastor Tim answers that question today. So yeah. he is in his sermon uh, today. And uh, so far, you guys have examined the lives of Abraham, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, looking at how these individuals share in the, uh, the, this great commission before it was this great commission, right? They uh, exhibited a life and, and to share the light of who Yahweh was. And, um, and so you guys have kind of followed along with those that they all had encounters with foreigners. And, uh, you know, especially, I think last week was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, or was it Jonah? Okay, so maybe I was watching the wrong one. That was two weeks, two weeks ago. Okay. Does that throw you off? No. Um, yeah, so even Jonah, yes, he does encounter those. And it's often in these stories, it's interesting that it, uh, even for the story of Jonah, that it's the outsiders who are actually more perceptive of what God is up to and what he's doing, then it's obviously the insiders. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in whom Jesus is working with in Jerusalem. And so, uh, so far we've examined their lives. And just to kind of summarize, Abraham, he has this calling from God in Genesis chapter 12. I think I have the scripture up here too. And it says, uh, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your kindred in your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whom who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the blessing that God bestowed on Abraham, that he would then be the father of many, and that identified that the children of Israel, that their main purpose was a selection that they would demonstrate Yahweh, the way of God, to the rest of the world in the way in which that they lived and how they treated others. This was this divine, divine call and this universal blessing that they would be this nation that would continue to bless those on and on and on. And obviously today we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about the Christ, and we see that Jesus is... And what Paul talks about, he has this interpretation that he sees Jesus as the seed of Abraham's blessing, of his descendants. And he says this in Galatians chapter 3. It says, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. And so one of the things I love about studying Paul is Paul is doing interpretation. So he's reading the Old Testament scriptures and he's realizing with this new revelation of who Christ is, this newer layer of meaning of the Old Testament that he plays on. And this is what he does in a lot of the epistles, is that he gets this, this deeper layer, this, this fuller meaning on, on what the text was doing. And so he's looking and seeing that Jesus is the seed. And obviously this is total Sunday school knowledge, right? Oh, Jesus yes. died on the cross mm -hmm. and then blessed all, all nations, that they would all be blessed. And so Jesus, even the, the, the purpose of his life was the bringing of this blessing beyond the nation of Israel. And we know that Jesus went to the nation of Israel, but they were not as receptive. We often see the disciples, even their struggle 
to understand. And you can see this in time of uh, in the Gospels. Jesus is speaking to the disciples, and he's trying to teach them. He's trying to uh, show them who he is, his lordship. But just like in Jonah, it's often actually the outsiders whom he's, he's reaching who are identifying Jesus as the Lord. They continue to call him teacher. They, they struggle to understand because at the time that Christ came, it's within this reality that people had a, a, a changed view of what the nation of Israel was supposed to be. And we're going to get into that. And that's why I think we need to give them a little bit of a benefit of the doubt. We need to give them a little less because I know for us now we look at them and be like, why did they not see Jesus, right? How did they not see what he was doing? It's so easy when we look at it. It's like, come on, like... The disciples were stupid. They were ridiculous, right? Even the, the nation of Israel. But that's not really giving them as much credit as maybe what they should be. Okay? So, we're going to move into talking about the time of Jesus' coming because I think this is, this is really, really important. When, in our modern minds, we think of our religion as something as even what, or, or what Evelyn was saying, kind of like a choice. We can kind of look at our world and we can kind of make a decision on how we think the world came to be, and we can kind of have this mental, philosophical thinking about the world. We have to understand the nation of Israel, their religion, wasn't just some philosophical idea that they came to some conclusion on. It was directly tied into their history. The God wasn't, God wasn't just some far away, distant person. They saw the sun, they saw all these other things, and they had to kind of make up reasons for why the, God, the gods or whatever came to be. This was all the other nations, but Israel, Abraham, it was all connected to this story that the Yahweh, their, their faith, their religion is directly in line with their experience as their identity as a people group. And we see this in this image here. We see the, you know, the Israelites crossing the Red Sea, right? This is the story that for centuries they told their children of this rescuing after Abraham, you know, moved down into Egypt with the people, and then eventually they became enslaved to the Egyptians, their, their faith was a tangible, historical part of their being. So it wasn't that they just made a decision, this is the God I want to believe in, there's these other gods. It was a part of their people group. It was a part of their identity. And, uh, the, and the idea for them was that they were always kind of enslaved and looking for, for God to redeem them, to take them out. Even looking through the Old Testament, we see that they continually encounter, because Israel is such a small little group of people, this is the beauty and the amazing thing about God, is that he chose a very small, select group of people, not the most powerful, not the Babylonians, not the Assyrians. He chose this small, tiny group of people who are always typically at odds with other larger groups of people. And we know that uh, the, after even the Egyptians, after they came out of that, they ended up going into with the Assyrians and being captured by them, by the Babylonians. And so they're continually in this rhythm of God needing to rescue them, God needing to bring them out, right? And so you got to give them a little credit because they were, at the time of Jesus, they were under Roman occupation, right? At the time, Rome was the giant power. And so Israel, Jerusalem, the temple, everything was underneath their occupation. And so they were expecting, in the rhythm of their history, for this prophet to come to release them that yet again from this Roman rule or this, this greater force to release them so that they could worship and have their sovereign identity as the people of God. Right? So you think about it. If you're occupied by a, a governing force like that, you're, you're thinking, if God's going to do something about this, he's going to release us from this, right? He's going to move us out of this, uh, this Roman uh, power. But the way that Jesus came, as we all know, and we look back now, he wasn't removing us from any sort of uh, public power that was there. He was actually removing us from a much greater reality that wasn't seen, Right? Is that through our sin and, and all the things that enslaves us, it isn't actually humanity that's enslaving us. It's this issue with sin. It's this greater issue that's taking place. And so when you reach this time, it makes a little sense why they would probably have a, some issues with Jesus. And that's why I think even Peter, when Jesus was taken, he took up the sword and started to, you know, 
have at it. I think they saw it as a they saw it as a violent revolution of Rome, and there were a lot of groups in that uh, that thought that way. And I'm saying all this to say again to give them a little bit of credit in not misunderstanding the what Jesus came for and the purpose of why he came. Okay, and so it's not just that he's. You know, it's not that he's removing them from Israel's, they're from their captors, just like in the history, but he's removing all of humanity from their captors, which is sin and death in this greater reality. And so when you look at Jesus' life, you have to really wonder, why was, why was he so controversial? Why was Jesus so controversial, especially with the Pharisees? And I was curious to see, hear some of you guys' perspectives at the time of Jesus. What made Jesus' life and ministry so controversial, especially with the Pharisees? He was preaching something different. He was preaching something different? Anyone else want to have any thoughts on what was so controversial in Jesus' life and ministry? Well, he stood up against the Pharisees. He, he went to the temple. Mm -hmm. He... Uh, drew the people away from what they were used to hearing and they were hearing something new and they were jealous. Yeah, he stood up to the Pharisees in a lot of ways and that their own, he opposed their self-righteousness, right? They were very inward and focused on their own purity and their own difference and their own self-righteousness. Did I see a hand over here? Mike? One of the things he was claiming to be a Messiah, mm -hmm. which wasn't the issue. Mm -hmm. They were all looking for a Messiah. The problem is, they weren't looking for a divine Messiah. Mm -hmm. and when he began to claim that he was God, yeah. they said, this doesn't match. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our concept of Messiah mm -hmm. is not this. Yep. Yes. Yeah, the concept, the, the difference was that he's claiming the Godhead, that he was a part of this mm -hmm. divine Godhead. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, John in the back, I saw your hand first. Yeah, his ministry in some ways threatened the, the Pharisees because it was threatening, in a lot of ways, their order of things. Yeah. Yeah, even like overturning the tables at the, at the temple, he was reestablishing what the temple was meant to be, but it was fueling a lot of their commerce, and especially for the Pharisees. Uh, let's... Yeah. I think a lot of it has to do, too, they probably had their own impression of what he should have looked like, yeah. and he didn't fit the mold. Yeah, yes. That's definitely an end. We're going to talk about some of that. Dave? The abolishment of the law. The abolishment of the law. We're going to talk about that, too. There's a lot of little things. It's interesting when you look at the way of Christ and what he did and the kind of some of the things we think maybe was the reality of actually wasn't what they were is upset, but we're going to talk about that. Dave? I was going to say something similar. But, yeah. Um, you know, he said he didn't come to abolish the law, but uh, to fulfill yeah, the fulfill law, it. right? And so yeah. everything he did was like uh, an order of magnitude greater than what the law was understood to mean. You know, the legalism that the Pharisees held for every little thing that you had to do, you know, 10 steps to this and that or whatever. Yeah. Jesus said, yeah, but what's the purpose behind it? Yeah. And so that created controversy, every single little thing. Yes. He was really, in a lot of ways, undermining all of these structures that they created, especially the Pharisees, with, with some of even their extra laws that were added. And Jesus didn't oppose the Ten Commandments. He didn't oppose any of those things. He reinterpreted it for their time. He was reinterpreting things that they had kind of taken too far with building security and adding on all these additional purification laws and all these types of things. And so, and so these are all different, you know, things that Jesus dealt with and the kinds of things that made it more controversial. Because we're talking about the implications of the Great Commission, I want to focus in on um, that, just that, that Jesus' life was represented this work of God, that it was moving beyond Israel, and a big reason, one of the big reasons was he caused so much controversy, was controversial times, he was that he was spending so much time with the people who were the outsiders, right? Those who were deemed unpure, those who were, you know, the lepers, the, you know, all this, those sinners who the Pharisees would, would see. And you have to understand the Pharisees, they believed that they were in captivity by Rome, they were occupied by Rome because of the sin of these people. 
So they, they seeing those who were leprous and all those, it was, they pointed that their theology was that it's because they've sinned, right? And so their idea was that we just need to become more holy. We have to get rid of these people who are, who are lower than us. We have to work, have works and, have be, and work on our holiness. But Jesus wasn't necessarily, he was working with holiness, but it was something different that God's mission was was taking place, which was bringing the light to the Gentiles. It was bringing this thing to fruition that that Israel would be a light to all the nations. And so we see this, uh, one of my favorite uh, scholars is N.T. Wright, so I always have a quote from him in here. And uh, here's his quote in talking about uh, this issue. He says, Jesus' clash with the Pharisees came about not because he was uh, an atom at antinomian, or because he believed in grace and faith while they believed in justification by works, but because his kingdom agenda for Israel demanded that Israel leave off its frantic search for national purity, regional hegemony, which is like power, that they gain more power, reinforced as it now was by the ancestral codes, and embrace instead the proper vocation to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. So Israel was concerned with themselves. They were concerned with their captivity. They were concerned with their purity. And there were different groups of people who were at odds, blaming others for why they were in this state. But they were completely missing the point that God had appointed them as a selected group of people. They were so focused on being so special, right, that they didn't realize their, their, them being special, their selection was for the sake of the other. That is why Jesus continually modeled this servant leadership. He continually modeled looking outside the sacrificial giving of himself for the sake of the other. And so we move into Jesus' ministry. And, um, you know, if you think of, this is, uh, I, I did get a couple notes from Pastor Bob, and I mentioned this. He had some notes on there, and I'm trying to, like, because he just thinks differently, and he's got it all up here. So I had to, like, uh, take some of it, but I thought this was worth mentioning. Looking at the, the life of Jesus' ministry, especially in his uh, ministry towards Gentiles, and uh, if we look in the book of John, actually the Gospel of John, it speaks of the whole world, this idea of the cosmos, 74 times, well, Matthew is only 10 times, Mark 5 times, and Luke 7 times. And so you can kind of see John's theology, and even all of the Gospels, they're, they're trying to show this uh, kingdom mindset that the gospel is to go beyond Israel. And so we see this in John chapter 1. I don't know if I have it on here. Yeah, here's a few. Or no, this is, yeah, this is a little further. Here's a few. John chapter 1, verse 9. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. 129. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, as the Pharisees were doing, but to save the world through him. And so there's a ton of verses of this, this uh, focus on this out, outer work into the world. right? While Israel was holding in and trying to protect their sovereignty and their identity, God's concern wasn't for that. It was actually for the mission of God to, to go out into the world. And I'll say this too. If you have any questions as we're kind of going through this, please raise your hand and we can kind of dialogue about this uh, as we go. And we see this in Jesus' ministry. He ministers to people outside the house of Israel. And this reflects the mission of God. This continually reflects the mission of God. In John chapter 4... Uh, verse 1 through 42 is the story of the Samaritan woman. And all these stories we, we know and we've heard before. And if you know the time with Samaria, Samaritans were half-breeds. Okay? So while the, the race, while the, the, the Jews were uh, under siege by the Assyrians, while they were in captivity by the Assyrians of the northern kingdom, uh, certain people stayed behind while they, the others had left to return to their land. So these people who stayed behind married and intermingled into marriage with the Assyrians. And so this became the people group of the Samaritans. So these were like traitors 
to Israel. These were the ones who went off to foreign gods and married and did exactly what they believed not to do. And so this was a very hated group of people by the Jews. And the same with the Samaritans hated the Jews as well. So there's a lot of contention here, right? This is a very, imagine just in, like today, like two people groups today that there's a lot of contention with. And Jesus is publicly going to walk through Samaria. And this was a, they had a route that was specifically, it was quicker to go through Samaria, but people would go around it because they didn't want to get near them. They didn't want to have confrontation. All right? This is a very normal thing, just as you drive around certain places because you don't want to go there, right? We all do it. So Jesus goes into Samaria, and not only is he in with a, he's talking with a uh, Samaritan person, it's a Samaritan woman in the midday. And this was the time that no one would go to the well, so she had to go to the well at this time because no one would during the daylight because it was so hot, right? And so even in this interaction that Jesus is, is having, his life is exemplifying this this almost going into what they would deem as unclean places. Because he's not concerned with this idea as they would. Their, their idea is if they touch me, I might get their uncleanliness, right? Same with the lepers. And so Jesus, is, he's not coming from this protective sense. He's going at it from this offensive sense, if you think of it in a way. Where he's confident in the mission of what he's doing and working in, in, this, uh, in his ministry. And so we see this with the Syrophoenician woman in Matthew chapter 15, the Roman centurion of Capernaum whose servant was ill, John chapter 4, the nobleman of Capernaum who effectively pleaded for the healing of his son, in Mark 5, the uh, Gardarian, I'm not sure where that comes from, from who Christ cast out demons, and then Mark in chapter 7, the deaf man of Decapolis who was healed. And so time and time again, we see Jesus teaching, teaching about the kingdom of God, and then going and doing this ministry. And I think this was the, one of the most defining aspects of Jesus' life that made the Pharisees so upset. Because it was the very thing that they were standing against was this keep maintaining their identity in this sense. But Jesus was breaking down the walls. He was going to these people who, who the Jews had deemed as unclean as the reason why they're in the captivity, right? And so the Gospels show this rhythm of these outsiders, that Jesus' lordship is in contrast, especially with the disciples, that the disciples still struggle to understand what he's doing and why. And they're afraid to be caught with Jesus, just as uh, you know, Peter denounced Jesus before that woman. He was, they were afraid for what Jesus was doing. They weren't really understanding it. And they, but it was those who were the outsiders, those who were in need of a savior, knew what Jesus was. They knew him as lordship because they knew that they needed help. And I think in a lot of ways, Israel, they knew they needed help, but I think that the means by which they were going to have the help was not the way in which God was actually going to deliver that help, right? Which is why Jesus continually offered peace and saying, live this life of peace and, and talking about those of the peacemakers and we'll get into that in his teaching in the Beatitudes and they didn't want to make peace they wanted to revolt and that's why eventually in Jerusalem in 70 AD the Romans finally took over and destroyed the temple because of just this constant struggle of the Israelites not being able to be in peace with this time and eventually they just ransacked it all and so Jesus came with a completely different set of a notion in which of their identity as the nation of Israel and the mission of God. And so when we go to the, the teachings of Jesus. Hey, Pastor? Yeah, Dave. So, I think you brought up something very important is the identity of the Gentiles is also in Christ. Mm -hmm. But before Christ started his ministry, his identity was being challenged by yes. yeah. the evil one. Do you mean in, in him in his uh, as a Nazarene, or uh, as when when he was tried again by Satan? Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Satan was trying to mm -hmm. test his identity. Yeah. And yeah. Our identity is in Christ, and he's going outside of. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was the the challenging thing I think for Jesus because he was both God and man. 
I think he did have a lot of temptation to try to fulfill other people's agendas, right? Anyone else struggle with that sometimes? <laughs> someone asks you to do something for them, you struggle to kind of like appease someone or make them happy, right? Uh, Jesus struggled with this in a way, and I think by which you're talking, especially with him going out into the desert, and that Jesus uh, was his identity, and even the three temptations of Jesus was actually to misuse his power, right? It was for him to gain it. Right now, you have that power, right? And setting him up above uh, Israel, if you just bow to me, to Satan, he would give them this power. And so, yes, he, his temptation was to really act in the way of Israel. It was act in the thinking of Israel versus to actually understand his call to serve and submit and to sacrifice himself. So, to kind of add what you were saying with that. So, let's turn to the teachings of Jesus. Anyone else have any anything you want to mention this time? So let's go to the teachings of Jesus. As I had mentioned before, the Gospels often mention this model of Jesus. If you've ever like studied a Gospel and you actually look at it, not just in terms of the stories, but look at it how they put together the Gospels. Because remember, that each of the Gospel writers had a reason for writing. Obviously, it was about Christ. But they included certain things because they were trying to get something across. So it's important to see, you can miss some things sometimes if you don't really, if you don't take a look back at the Gospels in their layout narratively, where we continually find Jesus teaching, <clears throat> the disciples and others not understanding, and then Jesus going out and doing exactly what he was teaching, which was healing, his miracle ministry, reaching those who we, they would have deemed unclean. And so we see this even in the Sermon on the Mount, the great sermon from the Christ in uh, Matthew 5 through 7. This is the sermon, the right, the haves and the haves nots. And it said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Even Jesus' teaching ministry was contrary to the kinds of uh, people that they should have been thinking about. Even the Pharisees just building their own self-righteousness. And he often opposed the Pharisees because they would do acts of service and acts of uh, uh, righteousness in front of others, like praying in the streets, because they had to be viewed by the people as these holy people. But Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. Right? There was nothing in them. They, weren't, they were just maintaining this, this religion. They were, they were losing track of the whole point of it, the whole heart of what they were to be as the people of God. And so he's speaking this, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, those who actually have need of this. This is whom God is trying to reach. This is whom God cares about. In Jesus, we see, and some people who want to go in the Old Testament and try to like wrangle with things like genocide and all these other things and, and make claims about who God is, I always point people back to Jesus. He is the best representation of who God is, what his heart is about, and the work that he's doing. Jesus is this representation. And so we see time and time again these, his teachings, he always flips, uh, flips the narrative for everybody. Here as well. The poor in spirit are not blessed, right? Those who mourn are not blessed. Those who are meek, they are not blessed. It's those who take, right? Those who take from others, they end up getting blessing. Those who are merciful, they're not blessed, right? That's the way in which the world would see things. But Jesus is saying the opposite. And so he's not, as we see even the contention with him, he's not uh, abolishing the law. He's not doing anything against the, the, the Jewish religion, but what he is doing is he's fulfilling the law in a way that they don't want to be fulfilled because they want to maintain their identity. And so this is where in Matthew chapter 5, he says, do, do, you, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And we find in the parables as well, going uh, in Jesus' parables, 
These were the stories that he used to demonstrate some sort of meaning, some, some type of meaning. And sometimes when we read them, we kind of see them as just like an old story. But it's amazing at the time, I think these stories were actually very charged. And people who hear them would be like, whoa, that's, that's a lot you're saying right there. That's a lot you're packed in. And we can see this even in the Good Samaritan story. If you want to turn to Luke, if you've got your Bible or whatnot, Luke chapter 10, verse 29. give an idea of this. We've all heard the story of a good the good Samaritan Back when I was in youth group, I made a little video of the Good Samaritan for my youth group. So I have some uh, memories with that. Let me pull it up here. Okay, so notice these parables too. We have to read them in context. Where it says, even in verse 25, it says, Behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, so he's not even looking to, to learn from Jesus at all. He's just trying to test him. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So he's having Jesus, again, interpret. So Jesus is reinterpreting what he would deem as his neighbor, right? Because this guy is just trying to do a bunch of works to maintain justified before God. And yet they're completely missing the point of, of, of his religion, of his faith. So he tells this story of the Good Samaritan. He says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the, that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite. When he came to the place he, and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And I could imagine him reluctantly saying that. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. And so we read this story, it's often like, oh, it's the person who helps the one in need, right? But you have to understand, he used those, those, the, the priest and the Levite as a demonstration, saying that you aren't doing this. And look who's the one who's actually fulfilling this. It's the Samaritan. It's the very one in whom you're deeming unclean, yet they're the ones who are actually doing the will of God. They're the ones who actually have eyes to see. And so you can imagine, they, we don't have, sadly, anything after this. Did he stop off, right? Did he give his life to Christ at this moment, we don't really know. But we can see in these parables, this is what Jesus is getting at. Is oftentimes he's showing them a story, probably a familiar story, but he's switching the characters. Where it's not, they would have told the story, it would have been a priest who would have helped the Samaritan. But it wasn't. Right? It wasn't. It was actually the one, and most likely the person who they were helping was Jewish. So it pushed against this narrative, and this shows this, this care that Jesus is trying to help them understand the mission of God. It isn't about you. 
And they're so focused on their selection, they're focused on their election, and I think in a lot of ways we can feel this way as Christians, right? We're focused on our holiness, we're focused on our purity, we're focused on kind of even defending, even for as a nation, to be a, this Christian nation. But God is telling us, though, to go. He's telling us to go where there are those who are unclean. Right? Go where those who might be controversial, yet you are showing the love of Christ. All right? this, is, this, is what, this is why Jesus was ultimately crucified. I believe these things pushed and pushed and pushed the envelope where they were like, our jobs are in jeopardy, our reputation is in jeopardy, we need to protect this, we need to kill him. Because we need to maintain control, we need to maintain power. Yet it was through Jesus' sacrificial life, the sacrificial giving, that actually the opposite came true. That they did end up being removed of power. And that, they, that the, the Gospels ended up going to the nations. And we see this in John chapter 12, verse 32. He says, but I, when I am lifted up, up, up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. That his ministry, his life, would appeal to the world. It would, he would draw all men unto himself. And this is why, this is one of my favorite verses in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. This is where Paul, Paul's, he's thinking in the mindset of Christ. All his letters, he's writing it in the mindset of Christ. And it says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of of God the Father. He's trying, Paul's trying to communicate, look, we don't fight, we don't go on mission the way the world goes on mission. We don't conquest and use violence and take over to, to claim power for ourselves. We serve, we give of ourselves, even to death, because that is the seed that is planted. That is the kingdom work. And that is why 2,000 years from now, we are still seeing Jesus as the Christ, as the Lord, as the Messiah. Imagine if he would have tried to take, you know, Jerusalem by storm and violently take over and not be this light to the gen. It would just be a story in the history book. We wouldn't really know much about it. But because of Jesus' self-sacrificial giving for the sake of the other, that is when the, the work of God, the kingdom of God, is best at work. And so when we see, kind of in, in closing here, but the Great Commission, at the end of all the gospel narratives, we see this commissioning. And Jesus is resurrected and he appears before his disciples. He's, he's revealing to them their action now. I've done this for you, right? I've justified your life. Your sin is no longer an issue. Like, you are free. You are now under the banner of, of, Christ, of the Christ. You may now then go share of this freedom. You don't have to appease God with your works. You don't have to circumcise. You can now go and go to those who are unclean. And it says in Matthew chapter 28, we know this is in Matthew, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. What a different stance. Don't protect this. Let's go out and, and take this, right? A different stance. At Israel, oftentimes, even in Jerusalem, the people had to go to the temple to receive the Spirit of God or the dwelling of God, right? No one came out from Israel and, and went on beyond, but they actually had flipped the narrative Jesus did. And so in Mark 16, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But those who believe in my name will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes in their hands. They, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on, on sick people, and they will get well. 
In Luke 24, he said to them, That is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that it is written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead, and on the third day the repentance and forgiveness of the sins will be preached to the na- in his name to all nations. Beginning in Jerusalem, you are the witnesses of these things. And finally in John, he says, Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me. I am now sending you. And so really the question we can think of, how are we sent? And I think all of us have those different narratives. I told you that when I first met Pastor Bob, I thought I was going to be a missionary somewhere in the world. I was very excited about that, right? And now I I realize in my context, God is, through following in obedience and being open, God has brought me here. And I, I found myself seeing the value of the local church and the local body and then thinking, what does being sent here in Grand Blank look like? Who are those here who are unclean? Who are those with whom are building roads around the civilization because we don't want to have confrontation? And where could the gospel go in this area? And I think we can all ask that question. Who are you sent to, but also how will you go? Will your sending be just about building us up and making us feel more protected, making us feel have, like we have more power? Or do we go in where we give power to others? Where we go in places where maybe we're uncomfortable, where we don't hold the power, right? And so we have to think about this, that the sending isn't just a going. It's the, it's the kinds of people in whom God is sending us to and the way in which we're going to them. And I think that can be a very different narrative for us. And so I hope we can all kind of think of this and think of our own context. And um, I'm curious, I'm going to pray if anyone has any thoughts or any ideas from kind of some of the things we're sharing before we dismiss. Okay. All right, well, let's pray. And let's pray that the Lord would, just like the disciples, would just continue to open our minds to the places in which he might be calling us all to go and how we might do that. God, we thank you. Lord, that, God, you you flipped the narrative. God, that you've called us out of our comfort. You've called us out of the places in which we know. And you've called us, God, to the nations. You've called us to the Gentiles, you, who, with, with whom we might deem unclean, with whom we might say they don't have enough purity, they don't have enough goodness that the gospel that they don't even maybe deserve the gospel. But Lord, I pray you'd open our minds and help us to see the kinds of people in whom you are calling us to. All of us in our families, our workplaces, God, in the places that we are. God, I pray that you would call our hearts outward, that we would not just be focused inward, but Lord, we would be seeing those in whom God really desperately needs the gospel, really desperately needs the living and active word in their life. And so, Lord, I just pray that you can help us, as, uh, and here in Grand Blanc at New Life Christian Fellowship, help us to have eyes to see and ears to hear. When we read your scripture, that we can interpret it the way that you're calling us forward. God, and you would help us as we uh, figure out our lives on top of that. But, the Lord, we would open our, our doors. We would open our lives to those in whom you're sending us to. And so, Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this morning. We bless it in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you guys for being with me today.